Hi, friends. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I am so happy and honored to welcome today my friend Matthew Mayer. And Matthew is a former professional soccer player. He's an author and a teaching pastor at Coastal Christian Church in Ocean City, New Jersey. His blogs at his website, Truth Over Trend, have been read by more than a million people. And Matthew is a nationally known speaker and his Decision Determines Destiny program is sponsored by State Farm Insurance Company. And through that program, Matthew has addressed over 250,000 high school and college students through various events and assemblies. Matthew is also the founder of an awesome um, apparel company called Overwear. And he has a beautiful wife, Sarah, and two adorable children. And um, I think you'll be blessed by what Matthew has to say today. Hi, Matt. What is up, Debbie? Wow, after hearing that bio, I'm interested in what I have to say myself. <laughs> don't be fooled, uh, our listeners out there, don't be fooled by the bio. The best part was at the end, my beautiful wife and my two children, the greatest gifts that I have. So honored to be on this platform with you, Debbie, and looking forward to where this conversation goes. Sounds awesome. Well, one of the reasons I asked you is because you have written multiple books and they're all great, but um, the one that I felt would really be helpful to my followers right now is the one, I, I don't think I have the whole title, Imprisoned by Peace, is that the whole title? Correct. Okay. Um, reading that book, it's like, it reminds me of the Apostle Paul and Corey Ten Boom, when she wrote about being in um, the prison uh, concentration camps. And you talk about being able to have peace under such a hard, stressful situation. And though the situations may not be identical to what some of my followers are going through, the, the things that you learned and write about speak to everybody. It, with God's help, we are able to have peace that surpasses and defies our circumstances. So I, I really, um, that's what I'm hoping to dig into with you today and just see if you can share some of your experience and, and maybe give some the tangible, practical steps that people can take to try to find peace when we're in, you know, we're in turbulent times, it's chaotic, things are uncertain, and people are dealing with their own hardships and, and forms of adversity, even without the stuff that's happening on a global scale. And so I think uh, people are looking for spiritual help, but they're also looking to find people that, that can offer like some tangible advice to help get them through things. Right. Yeah. So the book, the title itself kind of lends itself to a message that is not based on a location right so i wrote it while physically incarcerated and i'll talk a little bit about how i ended up there and what the lord did in my heart while there but whether you're circumstantially incarcerated emotionally imprisoned spiritually in bondage the book itself speaks to those moments with the truth of god's word the verses that really drove the book were Philippians 4, 6, and 7, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests, and that word request means felt needs, whatever it is that, you know, you are in need of, your felt needs, let them be made known to God and the peace of God. So this is what I call the great exchange. You give God your needs, you give God your requests, and he exchanges it with the peace that surpasses all understanding. And the Bible says, it guards your heart and mind. And I always found that fascinating, Debbie, because where do we experience most worry, anxiety, stress? The heart and mind. Yeah. And God deploys his peace like a soldier to stand on guard on the heart and mind. That says when his mind stays on you. So speaking to God, like you, God, will keep that individual in your perfect peace. Shalom, shalom. When that person's mind stays focused on you. So the inspiration came and the subtitle is of you apart. It came because in a physical prison, there were certain ways that people viewed their circumstances. 
And I began to dissect everybody's views. And I remember considering if that's the way that my peers are viewing their circumstances, what does the word of God say? And how can I close the gap between the two? So I began to dive into God's word, coming to the complete opposite conclusion based on, you know, for example, uh, a prison gate slamming, Debbie, and it's loud. And you're sitting on the other side of that gate. And of course, the gate slams and you're locked up. You're locked in. You can't go anywhere. So most of my um, peers, my fellow inmates would have seen that gate as a hindrance to their freedom, right? Because they wanted to get out. But I began to see it as the opposite. The gate wasn't a hindrance to my freedom. The gate was actually a gateway to my freedom because I wasn't trying to get out. I was trying to be where God had me fully, presently. And that is where peace existed, right? As much as I would want to be with my family and friends on the other side of that circumstance, trying to get ahead of God is where anxiety begins. So um, chapter after chapter, I looked at different scenarios and different circumstances. And I wrote in such a way that I wanted anybody, even though they might never feel or see the inside of a prison, to at least find a hope that transcends their circumstances. So that's basically the genesis of that book that you're referencing here. Mm. Did you, um, I know you spent, I'd say, okay, let me go back. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, a big part of, of finding peace, it's not gonna just miraculously happen. We have to be very intentional with the things right. we do and the things we um, say, uh, say and think. So you want to touch on that a little bit? Yeah. Happen. In Jesus Christ, that's an active faith. It's not knowing information as much as it's sitting with a real God and learning how to create new habits and new patterns and new responses in our mind, as opposed to allowing thoughts run rampant and eventually swallow us and devour us. I've always found the definitions of the word anxiety and worry to be pretty expressive. Anxiety and worry are related, especially as it pertains to the Hebrew and Greek definitions. Both mean to be scattered or to, to strangle. And that's a pretty aggressive definition. So when we worry or we're stressing or we're anxious, we're strangling out what? Well, probably our joy, probably our peace, probably our vision, how we can see clearly our perspective based on our circumstances. So practically, I remember just trying to get a hold of my mind and bringing it captive to the word of God. So I'm a big advocate of when your mind gets ahead of you and you start racing and worrying about life, get in the word of God, get in a good devotional put worship music on and replace those thoughts. So it's one thing to remove the thought process and maybe busy yourself with um, what I would call an activity that really isn't productivity. So you've removed yourself from those thoughts, but you didn't replace them with something edifying. So a lot of people can busy themselves in life, um, numb out whatever it is they're struggling with and just busy themselves with activity going to and from Meanwhile, deep down in their soul, they're still being gnawed by that anxiety. So I've learned to not only remove those thoughts, but replace them with something that's edifying, something that anchors us. Of course, the word of God is the greatest replacement. It gives us peace. And I call it spiritual oxygen to be able to breathe. And literally anxiety and worry, which previously caused me to be scattered, makes me, the word makes me complete. Anxiety and worry caused me to be, you know, suffocating emotionally. It gives me spiritual oxygen to be able to breathe. So just one practical takeaway would be learning when those moments happen, how don't you remove yourself from it as much as you be willing to replace that same emotion, that same thought process with something that is going to feed you life, whether it's worship music or whether it's a good book that's biblically grounded or the Bible itself. Yeah, I, I'd like to add to that for a second. Um, it's, it's scientifically proven that you can't just um, say, I'm, I'm not gonna think that anymore. It, it, it kind of, the thoughts come back like a boomerang. So 
what you say is very important. We have to replace it. We can't just say, oh, I'm not gonna think it. So I, I do have some practical steps that I will put in, I have on my website. I'll put that in the uh, links when we uh, view, view this and people can find access to that as well. Right. So, um, you know, one of the things Debbie, that was really pivotal to, again, our listeners, our viewers are probably like, can you guys rewind the tape? Did, did he start off the episode by saying he was in prison? <laughs> yeah. I'm confident that at some point in one of the links, perhaps we can share, um, you know, the testimonial video that really does a good job of expressing and explaining my testimony, where I was in my past, the decision I made that landed me there. And of course, the work that God has done since and has allowed me to share that story of hope to many different walks of life. Um, but one of the things that really got me through very trying circumstances was I started my day. I made it a priority to start my day in the word of God. That was the priority. So before the day could pick up pace or even present circumstances that would swallow me or devour me, I spent the first part of my morning in the word of God. And that was where I would exchange my stinking thinking, my thoughts with I want to get to, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you would present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable, which is reasonable to God. It's a reasonable exchange. God gave us Jesus as a dying sacrifice. So we present our bodies as a living sacrifices. And then it says, and do not be conformed to this world. Do not be conformed to the patterns of the world, but be transformed. That's from the inside out by the renewal of your mind. And it's remarkable to see how many verses speak to the mind yeah. and the importance of what we think about, what we think upon renewing your mind. And that was ultimately how I was able to see my day with a view apart, a view that God would have me see it versus how maybe the people around me were seeing it. Right. I, I think it's important to note too, um, your mom, when I spoke with her and um, everybody watching this, Andrea Mayer is Matthew's mom. And she talked about, um, we talked about grief and how it makes you not able to think clearly. And, and it might be hard to read the word um, when you're like hemorrhaging as your mom called it. So I, if you're not, I, I, I think it's important if you can't read, then at least put on worship music, maybe put on uh, a, a sermon that's on the internet or something like that, but just continually feed your mind and your heart and it will pay off. You may not feel it right now, but, but it will pay off and it will help. And even yeah. if you have to pray 50 times a day, if your thoughts keep going back to what's happened or whatever, it's our brains are like a muscle too. The more we train it, the it's pretty soon you'll find, oh, I only had to stop and pray 30 times and it'll just get better and better the more we do it. Right. Would you agree with that, Matt? That's right. I okay. couldn't agree more. Um, yeah, sometimes the mind can be so clouded or foggy, especially when going through tragedy, right? Tragedy has a way of, and it's grief really. So I'm glad you spoke to my mother about grief and navigating it. And both you guys have the experience of navigating grief. So you can share such spiritual gems for people, but grief has a way of kind of just springing upon you when you least expect it. And it's very hard to focus. So I would too say worship this, but writing your emotions out on a piece of paper was very therapeutic for me. I actually kept a journal every single day, day by day, even if it was one sentence or one paragraph or multiple pages every day, I sat and I collected my thoughts and I wrote them out and it became very therapeutic. In fact, the book and the other ones are um, basically manuscripts that were put together based on those journal entries. So from prison, I would write one journal entry a day and I would send them out and my mother would post them on my Facebook or website, which I never saw while I was in prison. 
And I think, Debbie, that may be how you came across the story and my blogs and you were sharing them and they were offering encouragement to people all over the world. So as my mom said to you recently, I say thank you as well for your support from day one, really just with empathy, joining in on the journey and then partnering with us in so many different ways to have the opportunity to, to share hope, right? Hope for the brokenhearted. That's what this is all about. Yeah, for sure. Well, I remember very clearly, God has such a way of working things out. And that's what I want to spread hope and, and, and encouragement to is like, I just reached out to your mom. I had read some of your stuff and just wrote her and said, I am so moved by what Matthew writes. And, um, and this deep friendship has evolved from that reaching out. So right. I want to encourage people to, if you feel a prompting from the Holy Spirit, just uh, take it and go with it. Cause you don't know what God has in store, but he has used right. you guys in my life immensely as well. So I'm grateful for that. I would also add again, I know it's hard in the midst of trying circumstances to, I, I think I would encourage people. And I do this often when I sit with different people going through different circumstances. Your feelings, may it's real. Your emotions are real. But separating the two from feelings, what you feel, and the fact of faith and who God is. Because sometimes we often, through the filter of our feelings, determine who God is. And that's not how we should see God. God is faithful always. So no matter what we're going through, no matter how it feels and no matter how it looks, and I'm probably confident to say when you were speaking to my mother about losing a son, that circumstance didn't look good, didn't feel good and grief had its way. But I think what got my parents through and my family through was resting on the fact of faith that God is good circumstances might not look good. They absolutely don't feel good, but there's a difference in how we feel and who God is and almost falling back on that fact that God is good. And then I think hope begins to rise when you know God is good. I don't know how he's going to work this out for good, but it should at least give you an ounce of hope to say, all right, if that's true, God is good. His word says he's going to work things out, Romans 8, 28, for good and his glory. I think it helps you have the energy or the, the enthusiasm, which means God filled each day to keep going a little bit further and not get um, caught in, in, in a neutral position. I think we should always be moving forward somehow, some way, just knowing God is good. I hope that makes sense. That really, really, really became an anchor for me. Um, on days that it didn't feel good, I remember thinking, all right, but God is good. I don't know how this is all going to play out, but his word is true. And I'm going to rest assured that I'll see how this good is eventually going to be weaved into what would be considered ugly circumstances. Yeah. Um, I want to take a, a little detour for a second um, because you've been through something that a lot of my followers have, have been through. and. Um, so your mom talked a lot about losing your brother, John. And I know a lot of my followers have lost a sibling this year. And I was wondering if you could speak to that for a minute. Um, what helped you to deal? Because I know your whole family is very close. And um, could you just share a little bit about losing your brother and, and what got you through that? Was it the same faith and the same thoughts that you just spoke about? Very similar. I was 21 when that happened, probably in a different frame of mind and living not necessarily for the Lord. And I think that would probably be begin in being able to trace how I was not living for the Lord. But even though I was not living for the Lord when I was 21, I was a Temple University college student playing Division One soccer. When that happened, there was an instant snapping out of the things of complacency back to the things of eternity. And the Bible, especially house of mourning, interesting, than in the house of feasting. 
So basically, it's better to be at a funeral than a party. And that's countercultural, right? Because right. we don't want to be in proximity to a funeral or the loss of life. But that's a fact of life. We'd rather be partying and celebrating. Interestingly, my brother's death took place close to a time of celebration. It was December 15th, um, which we're approaching as we do this um, interview, December 15th, 2005. So instead of coming home personally for me to a long awaited, long college break for a college student and Christmas and seeing friends and family, we were coming home, me and my brothers to plan a funeral. And, you know, the lights of Christmas, they looked different and maybe different because you begin to become laser focused on the true meaning of Christmas. And it came through shock. Remember specifically falling back again on a foundation of faith that I always knew, but I wasn't living or practicing and you never really recognize what type of faith you have until it's tested. And I always say to people, faith that is not tested cannot be trusted. But the intellectual fact of faith that was, okay, life is short. Everyone is going to eventually die. That's a, a rude stat, but a true stat, 10 out of 10 people. But you never expect it to touch your life or your family as close as it does. And my brother was 28 years old. He just had a baby girl four months earlier. So there was so much weight added to just one tragedy. And I came home and, I, and to be honest with you, it was my mother and my father's faith that really inspired, I think, me and my brothers, my two other brothers at the time, seeing how they were navigating it, both in their own way. My mother was with her, her friends and her sisters in my home when I got home and she was crying. Absolutely. But they were also praying. So that was like one of my first zone. And I actually went to find him and he was in his office and he was kind of doing paperwork, but you know, you come to find out that was the, that was just one of the ways he was coping with a great tragedy, but it was the several days later where you saw this consistency with my parents and how they were constantly making sure the circumstances were being pointed to Christ. Like, and again, they might not have believed that in the moment, mm -hmm. but that was the pattern that I think over time they developed so that when tragedy struck, it was almost a natural response. Right. And my faith at the time as a 21 year old college student, I remember thinking, wow, I often tell people, especially when I'm on the road preaching or teaching, especially with men groups, the importance of being grounded and being filled by the word of God, because you never know when a tragedy can strike and you never know when people around you, wives and children, friends, coworkers are going to need an outlet to plug into. And I often talk about my father being a surge protector during that time because he was plugged in to the right outlet, the Holy Spirit, that he was able to allow his children and his wife to plug into him. And again, he might get on an interview and say, that's not how I felt. In fact, it was the opposite, yeah. but I'm saying that's how it looked. Yeah. And that's what I, as a 21 year old young adult needed to see. And I can look back in hindsight, Debbie, and say, I want to be a father like that. Me now today, as I have two kids, um, two and a half years old and eight months in the future. So they can plug into me. So I'm not sure if that really directly answered your question, but um, I think as a segue out of that, I wasn't living for the Lord during that season. So as, as much as I would say, it kind of snapped me out of the things that were complacent into the things that were eternal. It was a short lived season. Grief constantly visited my family for the next several months. I went back to college slowly, but surely got caught back up in the things of the world. And I say to people all the time, if you stop feeding your spirit, you will eventually begin to feed your flesh because there's no neutral position. And I began to feed my like 
And I think that is the beginning of my personal demise. And that is what led to an eventual tragedy, not too long after losing a brother. I mean, it was, I think it was only three years and three months where my family, my mother and father and my brothers would again be visited with tragedy. And it was tragedy that was caused by my hands, right? Something I did, which I think is a different level of grief. And I'm sure my mother might have talked about that as well. Yeah, it, it is. There is different types of grief, that's for sure. But um, I think it's your family shows so much what faith, it just sustains us through everything. And, and our, when we go through a tragedy, it should drive us into the arms of Jesus. And, that's right. and you definitely, I can see where that happened um, with all that you went through. You, you were not, you went in to that prison, one person and came out very different, but the trans, but the transformation actually started before you even got in there. I I believe it, wouldn't you say? Yeah. You know what? There was one Bible verse that I either read the tragedy. I was irresponsibly and recklessly responsible for an at fault drunk driving fatality. And that was six days after suffering a potential career ending injury from my professional soccer career. I tore my ACL, my meniscus. Six days later, like I said, I was living in the world of the world instead of falling back on the faith foundation that I was raised in a Christian household. I went the way of the world and I had drinks at several establishments, got into my vehicle, um, intended to make it to another destination, never made it. And that night, I often say, has not yet ended for me. All this time later, 2009, we're in 2021, going to 2022. That night and the ramifications and the consequences still echo into my today. Now, I've paid my debt to society as far as the legal system goes. I served 55 months in state prison. Um, By God's grace alone, I was extended forgiveness by my victim's family. His name was Mr. Hort Cap. He was a father. He has six children. And one of his children, a son, gave me a hug of forgiveness in the courtroom right before I was sentenced. So you're talking about before being physically incarcerated for the next five years. Gift of grace. His name. And I was spiritually liberated. So to say I went in one way and came out another is true. And, and you're right, before all of even that, there was one Bible verse, and I'll get back to where I started. It was Psalm 46.10, and it says, be still and know that I am God. And, it, and it, it's in the first person, God's speaking it. I am God. And I took those two words with my family, and every now and then I would put them on a you know little sticky pad and posted it to the refrigerator. I took my mom's cell phone at the time and typed in on the home screen, be still. And like, I didn't know that those two words were ministering to her, Mm -hmm. right? I was just doing it because I was, I don't know. I think the Lord was using me, the one going through it to encourage my mom. While at the same time, those two words became an anchor and actually became the theme of the experience. And even to this day, be still, is a mantra and the foundation that my mother and I um, work in and out of at times is the be still foundation. It's from those two words out of Psalm 4610. So I, I was learning to be still before even the circumstances that would eventually confine me for close to five years. And I think it was God doing a work in my heart before the court day. I went in knowing God Art, the judge, the prosecutor, my my lawyer, my victim's family. He he I, he holds his, those hearts and he turns them whichever way he wills. That's Proverbs twenty one. And I went in with a piece, and it was an awkward piece. It was like I shouldn't feel this way. I'm going in wearing a a, a, a suit, and I'm leaving wearing a jumpsuit, and I'm probably not going to see my family for a very long time, and I'm not going to see freedom. But I didn't know what was what was waiting for me. And, and I think there's a lesson there. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what God is going to do. So trust that he's going to do something. And it was in that experience that I was given that, and again, I, I think 
my words don't do it justice. The video um, of this courtroom scene it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. It, it and, and when I look at it in hindsight, all these lessons are in hindsight. I see, I see the 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 gospel because the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Okay, so we've all committed sin. For all have fallen short of the glory of God. So we're all sinners. And based on the the wages of our sin, we deserve death. So we deserve judgment. We deserve to stand before a judge. And our lawyer on that day can't talk the judge out of the consequences for us. Our resume, our good works, all of that. And, and that's what we deserve. And, and that's exactly how it should go. But that's not how God allowed it to go. It's, in fact, the Bible says he demonstrates his own love in that while we're sin, or sinners, in our sin, Christ died for us. And here I am standing before a literal physical judge on January 7, 2010, Debbie, and a son stood up, entered in, and interrupted the process and gave me in that moment something I did not deserve. And, and it didn't hit me until months later that that's exactly what Jesus did. Yeah. We deserve judgment. And, and, a, and the, the son of the judge stands up, enters in, and gives us himself and sets us free. And like that literally was a gift from God to have an illustration that impacted me tremendously. But to say that, even that, pales in comparison to what God did on the vertical so it's what motivates my my entire life, my ministry, every platform God has me on to share that he's given to. And I think that is the gift of empathy, being able to feel other people's pain, right? And that's what makes you valuable, Debbie, is your platform is, is huge. It's because you are willing to engage in other people's brokenness from a place of brokenness and touch their pain. And, and, and hopefully share with them that there is um, a God who sees them and loves them and is going to give them his peace. So, gosh, that was a, a million different sermons in one. <laughs> I know. There's so, I know we could talk about this forever. And you, I know you've taught Philippians and I've taught Philippians and because it's such a powerful book and Philippians um, 4, 8, and 9, that is what I tell everybody, memorize that, right? That's that right. right there tells people, if you want to have peace, think on these things. You know? these. And um, so I, you remind me of Paul so much. Um, I know your mom said that she envisioned you as a Daniel. And I, I see that too, because boy, you, um, you, you preach the word and you're fearless <laughs> when you, when you share the gospel and you don't bow before anyone. And I'm so proud of you for that. You're just, um, you're on fire for God. And it's, it's such an awesome thing to see. And, um, I know you have a lot to, to share. I, I just want to leave it open to you and say, say whatever's on your heart, whatever about this topic or, or whatever else that you, you won't feel led to share right now. Yeah, I would say um, in light of what I do today and what God has called me to, I can truly and sincerely say, Debbie, that what I do today is a combination of all the ingredients of my past. Yeah. The pain, the shame, the good, the bad, the ugly. So there's a lot of us that we want to forget what we've been through. And I, and I get that, trust me. But there's something about giving it over to the Lord as ugly as it may be, as hurtful as it may be. And I know this from experience. God takes it and he begins to use it and he builds in us character and empathy and compassion and courage and conviction because there's somebody in our future that is going to need the experience that we went through. And I think of second Corinthians chapter one, um, probably beginning in verses two, three, and four. And it speaks of, um, blessed be the God and father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, who comforts us 
in our various troubles. And then it says as transition, like he comforts us in our trouble so that we become capable comforters for other people as they go through trouble. So it's like, I had to go through trouble, whether by my hands or by life's unexpected plans, either or. And I think there has to be um, an understanding of that. Like even what we may have done with our own hands, negatively, failure, a lot of people are like, oh, it's, it's different. And I'm like, no, no, no. If you give it over to God, whether it's happened to you or you, uh, you or you did it, God uses it and he takes it and he does something in our hearts that I think gives us the authority on the subject, right? Like I didn't learn all this stuff in a textbook. I learned it through the hard knocks of life and it was hard and it was long, but I can look back now and go in hindsight, all of that was useful. Everything that the Lord allowed me to go through was useful today. So I wouldn't be affected today as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. If I didn't believe it, if I didn't realize it, if I didn't actualize it, if I didn't surrender to it, and if I didn't allow the pain to be my fuel for passion. So even in an interview like this, I'm struggling staying in my seat right now because I'm very excited about the messages that God gives me to share with audiences from all over. So I hope that is the final encouragement. Whoever you are, whatever you've been through, as hard as it may be, when you begin to give it over to the Lord, piece by piece, a little bit at a time, one day you'll see that God is using all of that. And he's going to use you to encourage, to distribute hope to somebody else. Somebody else out there in your life needs to know that God is good and that he is going to enter into their circumstances with them. Because right now, there's a lot of people that go, if God's so good, where is he? Right? If he loved me, why did this happen? And that's where we come in, Debbie. Yeah. That's where our platform says, no, no, no. Yeah. You might not feel it. You might not see it. Let me tell you about my experience. And, that, and that's basically what I do um, in ministry these days, full time. Um, I think, I think before I let you go, there's one thing that that's really popping out to me is redemption. Yes. You know, that God redeems anything and you may not feel it when you're going through something you don't see. We're, we're promised Romans 8. 28 that God will work all things together for good and we know from Genesis 50 with Joseph that God redeems what the enemy is meant for harm but that goes back to I think what you talked about you may not feel it at the time but I know you can speak that, that is God's truth that he redeems and and nobody is ever too far gone or to anything for God to redeem or use their circumstances Amen. I say nothing is wasteful to a God who is faithful. Nothing is wasteful to a God who is faithful. And that is Genesis 50, 20. He recycles even evil and he turns it into good. It's remarkable. Yeah. Uh, could you, um, cause I know that you're, you've studied the Greek and Hebrew and all that be still doesn't mean what people really think it means. Do you want to touch on that real quick? Yeah. So it actually is um, in relation to a cliche that's probably overused. Um, it's let go and let God, but the word be still in the Hebrew means to, to, to literally surrender, like to go limp, like, like picture a body that's in control and then picture a body just goes limp and, and falls and just loses all control, all ability all strength. That's what, what that means. Be still, be still and know that God's got it. Like, and a lot of us are trying to, in our own strength, get through our circumstances and, and we're exhausted at the end of the day. And our minds are, are completely stressed and, and, and be still is like, just let it all go. Literally go limp, surrender, let go. And in that, I think, again, the apostle Paul would write to the church at Corinth, it's in that very weakness that God uses. He called it a thorn. And I go, that's interesting. His thorn became a throne for God's power to rest upon, for God's strength to be seen. Paul needed to admit his weakness and literally go limp. And that is where God's strength begins to show up and show out. Amen. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much. I know that you've encouraged people and um, I'm going to make sure everyone has how to get in touch with you and follow you. And um, 
And I would ask too, if you wouldn't mind, would you mind praying for everybody before we go? Yes, I would be honored to just say a blessing upon our viewers today. Let me pray. Oh, Lord, our God, we come before you knowing that you are faithful, you are good, you are Jehovah Jireh, you are the one that provides perfectly all of our needs, emotionally, spiritually, physically, oh God, we come to you, thanking you for your goodness, first and foremost, asking you to continue to provide our very needs, show us what you require of us in these days, oh God, I pray for those out there struggling or suffering or experiencing any pain or tragedy, God, would you give them a kiss from heaven? Would you provide for them the peace they need to navigate their days or even their seconds? Even getting through a moment or a minute can be a struggle. So I pray, God, that through this broadcast, through this exchange between Debbie and I, that you would offer them encouragement and they would recognize that you are a good God, always doing a work, whether we see it, feel it, or know it, that is in your name. So I pray for every listener, every viewer, I pray for this season that we call Christmas, that we'd be mindful that you gave us your only begotten son and that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And that is a free gift that you've given to us, not based on any works we could do, not based on any good conduct that we have, but solely and fully based on the work of your son, Jesus. So we thank you for that. Thank you for Debbie and her platform. Would you use her? Would you bless her? Would you continue to grow her platform so she reaches as many people as possible for your glory, honor, and praise? And I pray the same to that end for the platform you currently have me on. Oh God, thank you for my family, my wife, my two children. And we pray a blessing upon every viewer. Bless them and keep them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Matt. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Debbie. The honor is always mine. Looking forward to connecting in due time. Okay. Take care. See you guys. Bye.